I can't have an EV because I live on the 17th floor of a flat. The range is nowhere near long enough. I can't afford an EV. I can't afford the insurance. Have you heard all these? Many more? I'm Dave, this is Dave Takes It On, and we look at the myths versus the realities of EVs as we find them today. The range on an EV is less than half what I get from my old diesel car, totally unusable. I need at least a thousand miles before I even look at one. Well, first the obvious question, have you ever driven a thousand mile in a petrol car without filling up? No, of course you haven't. Go to, they don't make them. The average UK petrol car can cover about four, maybe 500 miles on a full tank. Drive really incredibly carefully, you might stretch that out to 600 miles. So where does that 1,000 miles condition you set come in? The longest journey we can do is Land's End to Grono John O'Groats, 846 miles, and the fastest claim for that trip, Thomas Davis. I was making a video for Piston Heads. He claimed an average speed of 89 mile an hour for this and he ended up in court, where he had to admit under oath it was all made up for the video channel. You can't believe all you see, because otherwise he would have been fined for speeding, fined for dangerous driving, and probably banned from driving forever. Well, most of us are lucky, and Google Map agrees, that the average speed for this journey is 15 hours. It takes 15 hours. And the best accredited, properly checked, was on a motorbike, again, speeding, but 11 hours. Now, I'll leave it up to you to decide if Thomas Davis actually did the journey in one go or even at all. No food, no break, no toilet stop. Yeah. The average UK mile is 7,000 miles, and that is 140 miles a week. Longest I've ever done in one go is 350 miles. Once. But I needed a toilet stop in the middle. Five minutes. The reality is 99% of all drivers have never travelled anywhere near 300 miles without a stop. And for many, that distance is actually far closer to never having driven 100 miles non-stop. We just don't drive like that. One model's out now, Skoda Enyaq covers 352 miles, single charge. Tesla Model 3, long range, 436 miles. BYD Seal, 354 miles. VW ID4, 340 miles. BW iX4, 365 miles. Mercedes EQA, 345 miles. The simple reality is that most EVs can drive an awful lot further than your bladder or your stomach can. And it's what you can comfortably manage. And most people will just stop for 10, 15, 20 minutes, top up themselves and the car, and you're back on the road again. But for most of us, we drive about 10 miles a day, to and from work or to and from the shops. And then once a week, we might head off for a trip nearer to a 100 mile round trip. We do not drive 300 miles on a day out. So this myth sounds good when spouted by the anti-EV brigade, but most sensible people discover they simply do not need more than 20 mile range a day. That's 140 miles a week. And if you can charge it home, most will never anywhere get anywhere near the range of an EV at any time ever. It's just topped up every night, full battery the next morning. Well, I live in a flat, so I cannot have an EV. Well, despite the obvious comment, well, I can't have a petrol car because I don't have a petrol pump at home. This is a stupid argument. Of course, you can have an EV. Anyone who can afford one can have an EV. So that is not what they're really trying to say. What they want to be saying is, be honest, is I can't get those ridiculous overnight cheap EV rates offered to those who can charge at home. And they're right. Well, at least for now. The reality is they cannot. But that's very different to saying I can't have an EV. The first reality is that I just finished filming in central Manchester. There were several tall blocks of flats within sight of our location where we were filming. There must be hundreds, if not thousands, of houses and flats within just a few miles of here. I was filming at the White City Retail Park in Old Trafford. Here there is an 18-bay Tesla supercharger. It's exclusive to Tesla, Teslas only. They've got V3, 250 kilowatt chargers, 18 of them. Open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Although it's within walking distance of Old Trafford football ground, so on match day I suspect it might get a bit busy. As a Tesla owner, drivers get free lifetime membership to the fantastic supercharger network worldwide. Well, some of that network is open to all EVs, and these do get busy, but many are still Teslas only. 
And as a Tesla owner with free membership, the off-peak rate that this location was charging is 20 pence per kilowatt hour. And that is plainly ludicrous. Even a peak rate, it was only 41p. Let me put that into petrol perspective. An average petrol or diesel car, 40 miles to the gallon, costs around 15 pence a mile. For the maths fanatics, it's 130 litre times 4.55 litres in a gallon, £5.92 divided by 40 is 15p. Doesn't matter what car you do, you own, what car you drive, doing 40 miles, 130 litre, it'll kind of cost you £15 for every mile you drive in just the fuel costs. An average Tesla does four mile per kilowatt hour, but driving hard, you drop down to 3.5. 20 pence divided by 3.5 is 6p. Or you can actually thrash it, absolutely thrash it, and you'll pay 7p. Now, I don't know about you, but I seem to remember the 6p is far less than 15p. So go and get a Tesla, charge up off peak, you'll be saving 10p for every mile you drive. Now, it's nowhere near as cheap as the 2p those who can charge at home end up paying. But are you really going to dismiss 6p a mile just because others, who you don't actually know, can get it cheaper? And if you don't want a Tesla, get any modern EV. All do at least four miles per kilowatt hour these days. Three if you thrash them. So nip along to the nearby Tesla supercharger at the Trafford Centre. Open to all. You'll pay 31p off peak making driving around cost about 10p a mile if you thrash it, or as little as 8p a mile driven normally. That's half the price of motoring compared to petrol. I can tell you that if you could offer a petrol car driver petrol at half price, they would snatch your hand off and they'd be queuing up all night to get hold of it. I'll not put my family at risk if the battery catches fire. Or while most of us have actually seen more than one petrol car on fire on the side of the road, none of us, I suspect, has actually seen an EV fire. Yeah, we don't mind driving around with gallons of highly flammable liquid sloshing around in the tank that can and does explode in a giant fireball. Battery fires are remarkably rare. And even rarer now if people are concerned about it and they just choose the LFP battery pack. With a lower power density, these are almost impossible to ignite. The one or two fires that make the headlines are generally older batteries, which had much less control over that power. Modern batteries of all sorts, they're close to non-flammable. But we now have an even better choice as the Chinese has just passed a new law. It's called GB38031-2025. Safety requirements for battery uh, for electric vehicles. This states all batteries after July 2026 must be fire and explosion proof, even if crushed, bent, crashed, cut or drilled. In fact, that's actually the test. They crush it, bend it, crash it, <laughs> cut it and drill it and they have no fires. EVs are now far less flammable than ICE cars, but getting more and more safer. It will, will become the law, so maybe the Chinese EVs, well, they're not that bad after all. In the meantime, we must just settle for the European NCAP international standard that covers much, including battery fires on EVs. Hmm. Tests include a post-crash battery integrity, battery cutoff switch, voltage measurement, post-test HV, high voltage assessment, overall safety score, battery management system, BMS, post-collision battery, battery disconnect, specialised firefighting procedure. It's, it's all there in the Euro NCAP tests. And EVs consistently come out significantly ahead of the best ICE cars around. For safety, they really are difficult to match. The insurance is far too expensive. Ah, once again, a familiar cry, but once again, facts don't quite match up with the fears and myths. You're certainly when a new car arrives, even a new model, even if it's petrol, but especially if it's also a new manufacturer, the insurance premiums are high. There's no actuarial database on which to base premiums. There's uncertainty about availability of spare parts, repair times, plus questionable dealer support. To play safe, insurance companies just raise the premiums to cover worst case scenarios. Well, as the real data starts arriving, premiums are adjusted generally downwards, then in time they're based on actuary recommendations. 
This applies to ICE and EVs. It's no different. So in the early days, with very few EVs on the roads, very little knowledge about parts and repair costs, it's absolutely no surprise that premiums were well above average. This is normal. But time has changed all that. Today, many people are finding the premiums, though having risen generally right across the board, a little different to a comparable petrol or diesel car. As experience builds, so premiums continue to adapt. It's the way of the insurance world. But insurance, whether it's the same, dearer or cheaper, it's only part of the ongoing running costs of any car. In addition, there are servicing costs, and generally these are far lower with an EV than any ICE car. See, ICE cars have thousands of moving parts, particularly with the engine and the gearbox, while the average EV has just a handful. Overall, running costs are the key here, not any one specific element of them. There's no charging infrastructure. Well, time's a great healer, and time in this case rises to the challenge. A decade ago, charging infrastructure was woefully lacking. Most motorways had little other than a few with a couple of 50 kilowatt chargers. Many were poorly maintained. Far too many, they were out of order. And this put a huge strain on the driver. This was not range anxiety, it was charge anxiety. Where's the next charger? Will it be working? Will it be free? Well, the government stepped in and offered support to the industry, specifically charging infrastructure. They offered incentives, set targets, and the results have been nothing short of miraculous. Almost all motorway services now have rapid or ultra-rapid chargers, and most have in excess of 10. In many cases, they offer a choice of providers. This helps obviously keeping the prices down. The government set a target of 480,000 public charges by 2035. But only five years later, we're already a quarter of the way there. This is an incredible 114,000 public charges installed, working, and far more because the government also sets st safety standards for payments, um, payment methods and reliability. They don't include home charging or uh, workplace charging in this survey. This is out on the road public charges, but at one time a multitude of apps or RFID cards were required. That is now standardised as contactless payment cards. We all have these. Payment is now very much simpler. Yeah, apps are still on offer, but in most cases they offer a bonus, maybe lower prices, and they're purely optional. Reliability is set at a very high 99%, which sounds almost impossible to be true, but most CPOs are reaching and exceeding that figure. By far, most of the public charges are working at any one time, and there are actually hefty penalties for those who fail. Well, at the same time, the power they are able to deliver has been increased very substantially. No more 50 kilowatt dual bay sharing power between two cars charging at once. Today, even 150 kilowatts is considered really slow for all but the real budget EVs. Most chargers are now in the 250 or 350 range, and most can offer that power either to a single vehicle charging or shared between two bays with computer AI controlled power sharing. Just make sure that the EVs get the maximum they're asking for in most cases. Power to the site has also generally been increased. At one time, power was limited on the basis that, well, not everyone's going to be charging all at once and not everyone will be wanting the maximum. Today, far more chargers have dedicated power at the rated output. But even 350 kilowatts is getting dated. There are a good number of 400 kilowatt chargers. We met several of these at Fastnet in Bradford recently. And we met another handful in Blackpool that were rated at 480 kilowatts. Even Tesla are up in their game, despite all their cars currently being limited to 250 kilowatt maximum charging speed, the new charges being installed this year in the UK will be rated at 500 kilowatts, again with dedicated power. Well, for once, the charges are ahead of the EVs, as there are no EVs that we know of that can even accept 400 kilowatts, let alone 500. Another batch of EV myths busted. Hi, I'm Dave. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed it, please click the like button, leave a comment and uh, subscribe to the channel. It really helps us. Thanks for watching. I'm Dave.